This guy is the epitome of pure evil. It wasn't hard to imagine what he did to these women and the grief that he caused. That was an investigator describing the monster that we're talking about tonight. The serial killer known as the Poughkeepsie Killer, Kendall Francois. Hey Night Owls, I'm Matt, and this is Bump in the Night. Oh, like I said, we are talking about none other than Kendall Francois. A horrible excuse for a human being known as the Poughkeepsie Killer, because that is the town in which he did all of his killings. Um, but before we get into that, little housekeeping. Obviously, Kyla is not with me tonight. She is not as into serial killers as I am. So she decided to take a break, but I do believe she is working on a couple episodes of her own where she is going to take the lead. So that's pretty freaking exciting. Um, as usual, I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, the Tsunami Ghost episode shot up in views. I couldn't be happier. I love all of the support I am getting, and uh, I just want to say thank you. But also, do not forget to go check out the Instagram page. Uh, that's where you can find pictures and such of the topic we are talking about. Also, you can get sneak peeks of upcoming episodes. Uh, also, check out the YouTube, which has all of the uh, episodes recorded so you can see my lovely face. Uh, but also, there are some reaction videos on there that are pretty fun to go check out. So, go take a look. Uh, I appreciate all of the ratings that I've already gotten. Uh, the five-star ratings are fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you. And any uh, you know comments or reviews on the podcast, on whatever platform you are listening on, is always really appreciated. So uh, thank you all. I really, really appreciate it. So enough of that nonsense. Let's dive in to the Poughkeepsie Killer. So, Kendall Francois, the man who would become the Poughkeepsie Killer, was born on July 26, 1971. He was the second of four children. Only a few years later, in January of 1975, his parents would buy the home on Fulton Avenue that would become their son's favorite kill spot and where he would actually hide the bodies of the eight women that he murdered but before we get into his actual killing let's get a little bit of background on this monstrosity of a man and when i say he is a monstrosity of a man it's because he stood at 6'4 and weighed 250 pounds that is a big dude i am 6'2 and weigh about 220, 230, right around there. This man has got 20 to 30 pounds on me. He's a big dude. Um, so here's the thing about Francois. He is not atypical of other serial killers. Uh, you know, most serial killers, there's a pattern that, that you're able to describe. Obviously, they're not always going to have these things. I mean, obviously, with Francois, we'll, we'll say, but there are patterns that we see in serial killers. So one of the things is there was no sexual or physical abuse reported to have happened during his childhood. Uh, another thing is, is he, he was not one to torture and kill animals when he was a kid. And that's those are both things that we see a lot of in serial killers. Usually there's some sort of sexual or physical abuse in their childhood. Um, a lot of times they get frontal lobe brain injuries that we believe leads to serial killers like this. Uh, a lot of them have a, a brain injury at a very young age that just makes things not right. Um, and again, another thing that's very common is they kill and torture animals when they're kids. And there is no evidence that Francois did anything like that. Uh, the worst thing that I could find that happened to him when he was a child was he got made fun of in school um, because he was overweight. Um, he was quiet. He tended to, to keep to himself. He didn't talk much. It wasn't really until around 13 that 
and he di- that's when he discovered sports that he really started to feel better about himself. I mean, again, this is what's insane, is at 14, he stood at 6'4 and 250 pounds. At 14, that is unreal. And so it made him do really, really well in physical sports, like football, um, which he played a lot of. And that was the first time in his life that he said he actually felt normal, felt like he was a part of the team. Um, And so he played uh, football all through high school. Uh, And then he graduated, and in 1990, he enlisted in the Army. Uh, He served his basic training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and then he was stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, Lucky bastard. Uh, I feel like being stationed in Hawaii is fucking, ah, like the place you want to get stationed. Um, So he served for four years and then was discharged in 1994 where he returned home to uh, his parents' house in Poughkeepsie. Uh, when he returned, he got a job at Arlington Middle School, which is actually the same school that he went to as a kid. And within a couple years, he was promoted to hall and detention monitor. Uh, but sadly, it was shortly after that that the killings started. On October 24th, 1996, Francois picked up 30-year-old prostitute Wendy Myers. The two negotiated things as that type of situation usually does, and they ended up having sex until Francois became angry. For some reason, he believed that Wendy had ripped him off. Not sure where he got that from, but this is a thing that happens in multiple situations coming up. Uh, He began to choke her uh, so hard, in fact, that the hyoid bone was cracked. Now, the hyoid bone is a bone in the neck that it's very common in victims that have been strangled that that bone is broken or cracked in some way. And it generally leads investigators to the understanding that this victim was strangled. Um, Anyway, he continued to choke her until she was dead. Um, He then bathed her body, put it in a black garbage bag, and then hid her in the attic. Um, Sadly, she was missed because only two days later, Meyer's boyfriend reported her missing. And that was his first victim. Only a little over a month later, on November 29, 1996, he picked up 28-year-old prostitute Gina Baroni. Again, they came to an agreement on money for sex. They did the deed inside of Francois' garage before, again, he became angry and claimed to be ripped off. I don't know why he thinks he was ripped off. If he had sex, that's what he paid for. Um, Anyway, again, he strangles her to death, bathes the body, and puts it up in the attic with the other body up there already. Uh, She was reported missing around two weeks later by her mother. So that's that's what's interesting about these is a lot of these, they're prostitutes, but they have family members that are looking for them and are are, love them and notice when they're missing. Almost all of them do. Um, And it's sad because it seems like in society, you know, homeless prostitutes or, or not just prostitutes, sex workers in general it seems to come off that, you know, their death is less than, you know, like a family, you know, a mother of three or something like that, which is wrong. Um, And so I'm glad, it sounds terrible, but I'm glad that these women that that were killed did have people that loved them and did have people that were looking for them because it it helps with the investigation. Um, But that was his second victim. Later, literally, I think it's two days later, on November 30th, 1996, after dropping his mother off at work. What a piece of shit. He literally drives his mom to work, and then he picked up a prostitute, which is 30-year-old Kathy Marsh. He took her back to their home. Again, same thing, sex, money, and he strangles her. Uh, Again, he bathed her body and then put it up in the attic. Uh, she was reported missing 
two weeks later by her mother. Uh, it was at this time that Kendall Francois began to earn his nickname by the kids of the school he worked at. They called him Stinky because he always radiated a very disgusting smell. Uh, it was described as the smell of feces, soiled underwear, with human waste lining the fabric of his clothes. Here's the thing. You would smell too if there were three decomposing bodies in your attic. It's disgusting. I, he Think of the worst smelling B.O., but then add like the sickly sweet smell of death. As an exterminator, I have to deal with dead rodents and stuff all the time. And something, you know freaking that big barely not even a foot long can make a house stink for two weeks i cannot imagine what a full-grown female human body decomposing would do to a house not just one body but three so you might ask how did his parents and sister who also lived in the home not notice the smell well Sadly, the house was a trash heap. It was disgusting because it was extremely hoarded and they were all dealing with hoarding tendencies. And sadly, people with this disorder have a habit of ignoring things like that due to their mental illness. And don't get me wrong, it is a mental illness. Um, they tend to not think that things are as bad as they really are. So, I mean, if anybody's watched Hoarders, you see the the thing these people live in there is the house just reeks and because of their mental disorder it, it doesn't bother them they don't notice and that's how he got away with it was their house already stunk um i mean his mother came to him at one point and asked him what the horrible smell from the attic was and francois claimed that a family of raccoons had died up there and that's where the smell was coming from and don't get me wrong, a family of raccoons dying in the attic would stink for a good amount of time, but not like a body decomposing up there. I, it's I, it's unimaginable. They all would just reek. Um, anyway, his next victim would be in January of 1997, and it was 47-year-old Kathleen Hurley. Um, she disappeared. She had last been been seen walking along Main Street in the downtown area of Poughkeepsie. Um, she was reported by her family around January 15, 1997. At this time, this is when the police begin to suspect that these missing women could have fallen prey to a serial killer. Um, I'm glad they finally put it together, but a police officer named Officer Segrist began to work on a profile of the killer and he started looking for a pattern with this with these women and there is a pattern which i will get to when we get to one of the victims later um in march 1997 31 year old kathleen marsh was reported missing by her mother sadly she had not spoken with her mother since november of 1996 and that was also the last time she was seen alive so her death was probably during that time. My guess is it wasn't it wasn't until March when she was reported missing, but she died earlier than that. Um, and she did end up being one of the bodies that was found in his attic. And what makes this death even more tragic is she was pregnant at the time of her disappearance. So he didn't get charged for two deaths, but I would have charged his ass for two deaths with that one. So at this time, the police began to speak with local prostitutes, and many of them reported Francois as a possible lead. They explained that at times he would become very rough, even choking some of them during sex. So the police began to keep an eye on Kendall. Um... In some sources I read at that point, they started really watching his house more. But somehow this sneaky bastard was still able to kill these women and get them into his house. So this next victim that we're going to talk about, it 
it could she could be a victim of Francois, but we don't know. So we are talking about 27-year-old Michelle Eason, who went missing in September of 1997. So of the eight victims found in the killer's attic and crawl space, Eason wasn't one of them. But due to the timing, the police believe that she may have fallen prey to Kendall. Um, Part of his plea deal when he was eventually caught was to cooperate with the Eason investigation. But he denied killing her. He denied having anything to do with her. But the police got an inkling that he might not have been as truthful, but they had no proof. They had no body. Um, He was never charged with her murder. And sadly, she has never been found. Um, Her body has not been found. Nothing. Um, I believe... I'm, I'm torn. One of the reasons I say she may not have been one of his victims was she was the only African American killed. All the other women were Caucasian. So she doesn't fit the victim profile that Francois had. He apparently liked Caucasian women. Um, and he and this is this is also what makes him a little bit different. Not always, but there is a pattern with serial killers that they tend to kill victims of the same race. African Americans tend to kill African Americans. Caucasians tend to kill Caucasians. Hispanics tend to kill Hispanics. It's not always the case. Not at all. But a large number of them tend to stay within the race. And Francois did not. He he liked Caucasian victims. That was his victim choice. And that's why Michelle Eason, I, I'm torn with... I would say probably I don't know I'm torn uh Kyla and I were talking about this last night and she doesn't believe that that he killed her I'm torn part of me wants to say yes because the timing fits too perfect but at the same time the victim profile she doesn't match but either way I hope somewhere down the line Michelle Eason is found or her remains are found so that Hopefully she can rest in peace and her family can get, if she has family, um, can get some peace. But anyway, on to the next one. In November of 1997, 29-year-old Mary Healy Giacconi, I believe that's how you say it, but I I couldn't find a good uh, pronunciation. Uh, She was reported missing. Uh, sadly, this missing report was done by the police themselves. Her father, who is a retired corrections officer, reached out to the police to help him find Mary so that he could inform her that sadly her mother had passed away. They were unable to locate her. Um, and the last they could get was she had been seen alive in February of 97. And unfortunately, she would end up being one of the bodies that was found inside of Francois's attic. Later that year, in December of 1997, the newspapers of the area would do their first report on the missing women. Um, It was the Poughkeepsie Journal, I believe, and they were the first to report that these women were disappearing. And on January 18th of 1998, so only a month later, Officer Segrist, who was still on Francois's ass, um, followed Francois as he drove his mother to work. He then stopped the serial killer and asked him to come down to the station for questioning. Surprisingly, Francois did it, and he was questioned. But he didn't admit to anything. And when he was asked to take a polygraph test, he agreed and he passed. Um, which is why polygraphs are not admissible in court. Because there are many, many factors that can alter the results. Um, either giving you a false pause, like a false fail or a false passing. Because obviously, <laughs> he was lying. Because he had, at this point, I believe, five women 
uh, his body's rotting in his attic. Um, so yeah. Only five days. This guy's a ballsy motherfucker. Five days after being questioned. On January 23rd, 1998, Francois picked up a prostitute named Laura Gallagher. As usual, had sex, and he began to strangle her. But somehow, she was able to wrestle out from underneath this behemoth of a man. And remarkably, he convinced him to drop her back off where he had picked her up. I don't know why. I don't know how. But Laura Gallagher, you're a bad bitch. And good for you. Um, Because around a month later, she filed assault charges against Francois. And his ass got picked up. Uh, He pled guilty to the assault charges. But unbelievably, he was sentenced to only 15 fucking days in jail. You assault someone. I don't know why it was an attempted murder, because he was clearly strangling her. 15 days? 15 days. And here's what makes it even worse. He only served seven of those days. Seven. He was released on May 18th, 1998. I don't know how he only served seven days of a 15-day sentence, which should have been more than that, for attacking Laura Gallagher. Either way, Laura Gallagher, you're a badass bitch. Fuck yeah. About a month later, he would be back to his evil ways, because jail didn't teach him shit. On June 12th, 1998, he picked up and killed 51-year-old prostitute and mother of three, Sandra Sandra Jean French. And what makes this a little more sad is she was very close to becoming a grandparent. Um, So he did the usual, strangled her, uh, originally placed her body in the attic with the others, but for some reason... He moved her to the crawl space of the home. A few days later, her abandoned vehicle was found not far from Francois's home. And oddly enough, it was found the same day that her mother reported her missing. Um, The next victim would be 34-year-old Audrey Puglias. Puglias? I don't know. Uh, He picked her up on August 8th, 1998. Just like the others, sex, strangle, and her body was put in the crawl space as well. His last victim would be 25-year-old Katina Newmaster. After sex, he strangled her in the garage, and oddly enough, with his parents and his sister living there, he left her body in his car overnight. Uh, And then the next day she would join the others in the crawl space of the home. So at this point, this man has five women decomposing in his attic, three women in the crawl space. That house had to have been a nightmare as far as smell goes. It, I mean, it's hoarders, hoarders houses already have a stench, but eight bodies are decomposing in that house. I... The police questioned the family after he was discovered, and they found that they had no idea. I just don't understand, and I guess this is part of the mental illness with hoarding. I don't understand how you could could live in a house like that. And his nickname was very on point, because he would have reeked. But anyway... Uh, The night of September 2nd, 1998, would be Francois' undoing. He picked up a prostitute, Diane Franco, and again attempted to strangle her. But somehow, she was able to get away from him and again convinced him to drive her back to Main Street. And he did, and he let her go. After trying to kill her, he let her go. Again, Diane Franco... Just like Laura up above, fucking badass bitch. Um, From there, she ran to a gas station and reported the assault. Francois Francois was picked up and taken in for questioning. Uh, Apparently this time they were able to 
wear him down because he confessed to the killings of the missing women. And at this time, he was only charged with one count of second-degree murder. So over the next few days, and it actually, I think it took about two weeks to really to go through the house and do the autopsies and everything like that. So the bodies of the women were removed from this monster's home, thank God, because they deserve to be at peace and to, to rest. As unbelievable as it sounds, like I said earlier, the family was completely unaware of what their son was doing. Um, upon investigating the home, five decomposing bodies were found in the attic and three down in the crawl space. Officers with years of experience were said to have really struggled with the seam, and I don't fucking blame them. Um, one of them was so overcome that he had to step outside to, I'm assuming, vomit and compose himself. Neighbors came out to watch what the police were doing, and as they were doing it, they could smell the overpowering stench from that house from the outside. Like they weren't even near it. They were backed away and they could smell it. They said the house, the stench was so bad in the trash filled home that the police officers and those who went inside had to throw away the clothes they were wearing because it didn't matter how much they washed it. The stench of death would not come out of them. Um, some of them even said that the smell of decomposition lingered on their skin for two or three days afterwards, and that's with showering. So, again, stinky, perfect nickname because those guys were only in there to do the investigation. Can you imagine how bad Francois and his family smelled because they literally were just soaking in it? I can't imagine. Again, I deal with rats, and those smell bad enough. So, after gathering all of the evidence they could from the home, Kendall Francois was formally charged with eight counts of first-degree murder, eight counts of second-degree murder, and one count of attempted assault. And of course, like the coward he was, he entered a guilty plea because they made a deal with him to take the death penalty off the table if he pled guilty. In August of 2000, Francois was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I say we take him out back and put a fucking bullet in his head, but that's just me. He was originally incarcerated at Attica Correctional Facility uh, before being moved to Wenday correctional facility but i guess some good news comes out of this if you can get any good news um on september 11th 2014 this sick excuse for a human being died in prison at the age of 43 uh he during the trial he did get tested and came up hiv positive and his cause of death is said to be an AIDS-related illness. So, good riddance. I hope your last few days were incredibly painful and that you suffered because fuck you, dude. Uh, disgusting excuse for a human being. Uh, he just... Disgusting. So, yeah. That is the story of the Poughkeepsie Killer. Um, he's gross. He he is a conundrum because he showed no early signs of, of this darkness that was in him. He, he didn't have sexual abuse. He wasn't physically abused. He was bullied a little bit as a kid. Didn't torture animals. He just seemed to, all of a sudden, start killing these women. And he's very much, in my opinion... There was something dark in him from birth. It was he is definitely if you you come to a nature versus nurture, I believe he was a hundred percent a nature. He was born with something fucked up in him, and when he got angry and killed that first lady, 
he got hooked. Um, that's the only thing I can think of that would cause this is he just he got addicted to the power of having control over these women's lives and when they die and got addicted to it and so sadly in the end eight possibly nine women uh lost their lives to this this despicable excuse for a man but i'm glad that the families got the justice that they deserved that he was incarcerated and that his ass died of aids i hope it was painful so that is this episode of a bump in the night uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do uh, for Friday's episode. Um, oh, and I should apologize that this one's going to, it's a little late, um, but life happens. But I'm thinking something supernatural or ghosty or I don't know. I would love for you guys to let me know what I should do for my Friday episode. The email is bumpinthenightpodcast at outlook.com. Please send me what you guys would like to hear about, and uh, hopefully I can start doing those episodes. Hopefully Kyla will be back with me on the next one, since I'm not going to do another serial killer. So we will get to see her lovely face back with us, and uh, maybe she will even be taking the lead on a couple episodes here soon, uh, which will be cool. So that is all. I hope you guys continue to listen. I appreciate you all. And uh, Night Owls, I hope you have a good evening. I'll see you next time.